Hi everybody, welcome to our final unit for AP Art History. This is Unit 12, Global Contemporary. It's from 1980 to the present. Uh, this week we're going to have three videos. Uh, we'll do one Tuesday, one Wednesday, one Thursday. And those topics are on looking ahead, looking back, and looking all around. So just kind of those three different uh, areas. So there are about five pieces per video. Uh, and then we will move on next week. We will do the rest of them. So let's jump right in and get started. Uh, so a couple things to know about the Global Contemporary Unit. So some essential things. Uh, traditions have been challenged by the digital world. So in a lot of ways, art has a lot of tradition over time. And in the, this unit and at this time in the world, art is challenging everything about that. Uh, artists often appropriate works from the past, so they're using the images or the style or the technique to try to um, mimic some parts or make you think about them, but also add their own twist or their own um, information or story to it. Uh, contemporary art is very global compared to a lot of the work of the past, and that leads into our next point here about the Eurocentric views being downplayed or reassessed. Uh, so especially you could even look at our curriculum uh, during this contemporary time, during the 21st century, uh, the thought is all of a sudden this Eurocentric view of art is not really fair to the rest of the world and there's a lot of beautiful, beautiful work all over the world. So contemporary art comes from artists from all over the world. There aren't the limitations that there might have been in the past. Um, same thing with the next point, artists come from all different backgrounds. Uh, and exhibition spaces are in all different places. Uh, it's not only museums and specific galleries anymore. Art can be anywhere, basically. A couple points from history here. Uh, World War II, even though it was a, a long time previously, uh, still the aftermath of that in the world has really shaken things up. Uh, also, a lot of other conflicts around the world uh, that are still going on. Uh, they impact a lot of the 20th century and then into the 21st century. Uh, the invention of television was huge at the end of the 20th century. Um, and then also now internet and ongoing technologies are changing art all the time. Uh, and then social and political issues, especially because of the connectedness of how uh, now that we have media that can connect us to the news in a second, uh, social and political issues are uh, spanning multiple consonants even. And so artists are using these as points of inspiration and speaking to more global issues. All right, so let's begin. Today we're going to talk about looking back. Um, so how do artists, uh, contemporary artists, reinterpret the past? So a really nice one to start with is this piece, which this is by an artist named Yinka Shonabare. Uh, it's called The Swing, so I'll have the information on the next slide. But I wanted you to just take a moment and look at what you see. It is an installation, so it's three-dimensional in a museum. Um, you might see things that kind of remind you of something from what we've already studied. Uh, you might notice that there is a woman on a swing and the shoe is up in the air. So I'm sure that some things are coming to mind for you. So let's talk about those things. Uh, this is the swing from Fragonard, and you'll see some very, very clear appropriation of a lot of the imagery. Remember, this is a Rococo piece. Uh, we see lots of lush vegetation. We see all of the folds in the fabric. And remember, there's a little bit of uh, voyeuristic tendencies, too, because we do have the men that are off to the side, both pushing and then also underneath to kind of look up the skirt. So this is his reinterpretation of a work from the past. Now if we zoom in a little bit closer, the fabrics are all things that he creates um, to kind of mimic some other um, fabrics uh, that we'll talk about a little bit more. But you can see there's a lot of color, a lot of patterning. You might notice that the head is removed and if you look at the skin tone, we see something that is kind of a uh, not necessarily a white uh, Euro European person. Instead, we're seeing kind of multiple skin tones blended into one. Um, let's move on and look a little closer. All right, so for Yinka Shonabare, uh, he believes that identity is a construction, and that's a big part of his piece that 
um, he kind of looks at. There's a lot of cultural hybridity, so all of a sudden he's taking the skin tone, uh, kind of blending it so it looks like multiple skin tones together. He's also taking fabrics that were considered uh, African, some of the prints, and then they were taken by Dutch colonizers. Uh, the, the wax style of creating those fabrics was then taken to Europe, where they had Asian people working on in the factories to create the fabrics, and then they were actually reselling some of those prints back in Africa again. So there's a lot of appropriation taking, um, and then also he uses that in his patterns. He makes his own, but he does take some of those same uh, styles and patterns and puts them in here. He also uses the Chanel logo. Uh, within the fabric. So in the skirt there is, um, in one of the patterns, he's using the Chanel logo. And if you think about why he might be doing that, he's making us think that this is not just a piece that's referencing the past, but instead he is uh, bringing it into the forefront, making us think about appropriation and um, our current culture with materialism, with fabric, um, and with the handbags and, and Chanel. Uh, so let's talk a little more about it. So Shonabare is, uh, he lives in the UK, he is Nigerian, uh, he does a lot of life-size installations, uh, and with most of them the people are headless. He's kind of referencing the French Revolution and the fact that a lot of aristocrats lost their heads. So it's kind of like uh, a little bit of a witty joke, but he's also kind of like knocking them down a peg a little bit. Um, so here we see this wealthy woman. Uh, 18th century dress, and we talked about those fabrics and where they did come from. Uh, he also, in his sculpture, removes the men. So when you walk into the gallery, you can not only walk around it, but you can actually be the voyeur yourself uh, looking up the skirt. And so it's kind of integrating you into the art experience. Um, the function, he's having us think about hybrid identity and also class disparities. So we're thinking of the upper class and the upper echelon, especially the aristocrats during the French Revolution, uh, and then making you think about maybe your own class disparities or the class disparities around you. Uh, but really, identity is a construction. The fabrics are a construction of a lot of different places in the world, and so he's making you think about those. So a couple other things. This is him. Uh, here's some other pieces of his. You can see he constantly is using these beautiful fabrics. Uh, and here's another piece that if you look about all of, uh, if you take note, we've got Africa on the table and we've got all of these men in these suits kind of arguing. And it, this is kind of a piece referencing uh, how the colonizers were splitting up Africa uh, and they were kind of arguing about who gets what. All right, let's move on to our next artist. So we're going to look at the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. This is by Maya Lin, done in 1982. So she was 21 when she got this commission. Uh, and she was at Yale. She was just a student there, and she won the commission. It was a blind competition. Uh, and so I'm going to read you a couple of things by her. So the Vietnam Veterans Memorial is not an object inserted into the earth, but a work formed from the act of cutting open the earth and polishing the earth's surface, dematerializing the stone to pair surface, creating an interface between the world of the light and the quieter world beyond the names. So her whole point was to cut into the earth and make this scar, make this darkness. Uh, because when you think about the Veterans Memorial and uh, how many people lost their lives or were not found, uh, it's a very dark subject. It's, uh, she wanted it to feel very connected to the earth. And the polished stone was a way for her to have you walk up to it and see yourself amongst all of the names of the people that were dead or missing. So it's a, a kind of a dark, quiet, uh, minimalistic uh, experience. So to go along with that, it's a long V-shaped sunken into the ground. Uh, it The one end of it lines up with the Lincoln Memorial, the other one lines up with the Washington Memorial. Uh, and there are roughly 59,000 names, all referencing people that are missing or dead that fought. Uh, it's very minimalistic, very simple. So if you think about the 80s, uh, this was something that was a little bit shocking because it was so different than other war memorials from the past. Uh, the function of it, she wanted you to view yourself in it so you could relate to that experience, the darkness of death and war and violence. And it's purposely a, a cold, minimalistic sculpture so that you, um, you feel that. Uh, some context. So, uh, I talked about the blind competition that she won. 
there was a little bit of backlash uh, about it. A lot of people didn't like the minimalistic approach that she had in her design, and since it was very different than previous memorials, uh, a lot of people were really against it. Uh, they also, there was a lot of racism. So she was actually, uh, Maya Lin was born in Ohio. She's a Chinese American. Uh, and a lot of people were really struggling with the fact that this was uh, the war in Vietnam and uh, the fact that she was of Asian descent. Um, a lot of people were thinking that the style of the memorial was Asian uh, and for an Asian war. And so they were very upset by that. Uh, very unfortunate. Let's move on. So here's a picture of her with her model that she won for. Um, a couple other things we're going to read. So I made a conscious decision not to do any specific research on the Vietnam War and the political turmoil surrounding it. I felt that the politics had eclipsed the veterans and their service and their lives. I wanted to create a memorial that everyone would be able to respond to regardless of whether one thought our country should or should not have participated in the war. The power of a name was very much with me at the time, partly because of the Memorial Rotunda at Yale. In Woosley Hall, the walls are inscribed with the names of the Yale alumni who have been killed in wars. I had never been able to resist touching the names cut into the marble walls, and no matter how busy or crowded the place is, a sense of quiet, a reverence always surrounds those names. All right. Um, I'm going to skip this last one, but it does talk about some of the racism that she experienced. Uh, and so they still continued on with this memorial. It's obviously built, but uh, about a decade afterwards, this second uh, war memorial was created nearby. And this was more of a typical uh, war memorial, getting to see depictions of the soldiers. Uh, and so they did this to kind of... Uh, appease everybody by adding this in. Then much later, another one was added nearby because um, everything here was considered male. Uh, so they have this sculpture uh, referencing what the women did for Vietnam. All right, moving on to our next artist. This is by Cindy Sherman. Cindy Sherman is uh, an artist. She started around the 80s. Uh, this is a work from 1990 and it's a photograph and she always works with photographs but she does a lot beyond just taking a photograph uh, what we see here is actually cindy sherman dressed up like judith uh, holding the head of holofernes so uh, she does all of her work using herself as a muse so this is just a little bit about her from her perspective i never know what i want at the beginning she said Sometimes she will start with a body part like a fake nose and play with it. Then I'll see what costumes work with it. The makeup comes after. Uh, it's, and then she was also asked, is it difficult to engage viewers this day? She said, it's challenging trying to reach a jaded public, seeing God knows what in movies and television. We've become more callous to things than ever before. How can art compete with television and movie images? It can't. It, it should incorporate it. Use imagery as if from those things. So she's talking about our world and how over inundated we are with all kinds of images. And so it makes us uh, numb to it. And so she kind of uses that as her springboard in her artwork. Uh, she doesn't describe herself as a feminist, but a lot of her works do reference the lives of women. Uh, and even though she is in every portrait, she is very clear that they are not self-portraits. She is removing herself from it. She is transforming herself. She's just uh, the starting point for the picture. All right, so the picture that we have, uh, we are looking at Judith with the head of Holofernes, and hers is titled Untitled, but it's referencing uh, this common subject. It's a biblical subject. So we talked about how she does props, makeup, self. Uh, she has so many different props, goes to thrift stores, gets fabric, whatever she really needs to make it happen. Uh, and so the biblical story is about the heroine Judith who uh, rescued Israelites from the Assyrian general uh, and he, she seduced him and then beheaded him. Um, if you notice, this has this artificial look and feel. You can see that the head is just a mask. There's no blood. You can see her face doesn't really have much emotion in it. And she's playing around with the artificial in images. Specifically in this series, she's looking at 
uh, paintings from the past and how artificial a lot of the elements really are if you look or how posed things were uh, from the past in portraiture. She also does a lot with identity, uh, stereotypes, and then also using that history of portraiture and updating it. She described it as kind of a dead art form in the 21st century to be doing, and the 20th century, to be doing portraits, but she's kind of <laughs> reviving it in an interesting way. Um, she was starting to work and um, growing up in the 60s and 70s, so it's not surprising that feminine identity and then also stereotypes in film and media so much influence her work. So just to go into identity and stereotypes a little more in her work, I have a few other pieces by her. So you'll notice she is in all of these, but she really, really transforms herself. So uh, the first series, the one that we have, it's a history portrait. That's one of her series that she works in. She also did a clown series um, focusing on the fact that clowns are something we both love and hate. We're scared of. We think they're funny. And so she was kind of trying to like play with this line between the two. Um, she also tries to work a lot with uh, coming up with these stereotypes of different types of women and trying to uh, recreate those people. So there's a lot of uh, work that goes into what she does, but then when she finally gets that image, um, you kind of feel the person through the picture. All right, moving on, we are gonna talk about Kara Walker next. Uh, she's an artist, she works mostly in silhouette cut paper, and uh, this one actually has a projection of color on the wall as well. Um, so you see there are multiple figures back here. It's kind of narrative-esque, um, almost looks like what you would see in a storybook, but then we'll go a little bit closer and learn a little bit more about it. So she's using silhouette, which is basically just the black outline and edges. So you really have less to focus on or less uh, detail to know, but you're just focusing on the edges, the profile of people. And silhouetting was actually a 16th century women's art, uh, was something that was acceptable at the time. Now it's kind of considered a craft that people do. Um, and then she also had the projection of color. The content of her work, um, she uses these kind of caricature style people, uh, and she gets the images from uh, depictions of African Americans in paintings and books around the time of the Civil War. So there are um, exaggerated images of African Americans, uh, think around the time of slavery, uh, and so she's using those in this updated fashion. Uh, her purpose, the function of her piece, is or all of her work is around racial issues. Sometimes she talks about gender too, um, but she really wants you to think about, is this the past or is it relevant? Um, and I guess I didn't talk about it here, but what we actually see in the work is a lot of times you'll see aristocrats, you'll see slave owners kind of hurting um, slaves, you'll see beheadings, you'll see here's a person with a leg removed, you'll see lynchings, uh, beatings. So there are all of these kind of narratives, even though it kind of looks like this playful image, but when you look really closely, there is uh, a much, much darker side to what you see. Um, so yeah, she's asking you to look at these past images and ask you, is this relevant in our current culture? Um, she wants you to think about the realities of the African American experience back then, but then also what that might um, tell us about today's culture. And then a little bit of context. Um, I talked about how the perverse treatment of slaves is really at the forefront of what she talks about. Uh, also, there is phrenology. Uh, which is kind of linking intelligence determined by the shape and face of head. So um, back at the time of slavery and around the time of the Civil War, it was believed that the shape of your head, the size of your head, could determine how intelligent you were. And that was just a way to uh, continue with the inequalities between the races, just based on uh, the different makes up, makeups, depending on the race you are. Um, and then she's not only for forcing you to view uh, and remember, but she actually asks you to almost walk into the space because the shadows uh, you produce if you walk into the light actually add you to this frame, uh, this picture. So you kind of become uh, a part of it, just like the work by Yinka Shonabari at the beginning we looked at. Okay, so a couple others by Kara Walker. She doesn't always uh, use color. A lot of times it's just the black on the white walls. Uh, and this is something that she said uh, she's been thinking about when she made this work. 
The history of America is built on this inequality. The gross, brutal manhandling of one group of people, dominant with one kind of skin color and one kind of perception of themselves, versus another group of people with a different kind of skin color and a different social standing. And the assumption would be that, well, times changed and we've moved on, but this is the underlying mythology. We buy into it. I mean, whiteness is just as artificial of a construct as blackness is. So it's just kind of talking about identity and race as a construct um, similar to what we've looked at in some other artists. I want to show you one more by her quickly. Uh, this is one of her newer works. It is a giant sphinx of an African-American woman um, made completely of sugar. So if you think of slaves working in the sugar cane fields, uh, this is uh, something that kind of references that, and it's one of her newer pieces. All right. All right, continuing on to our last artist for today. Um, this is a piece by Wangechi Mutu. It's called Praying Mantra. It might look like Praying Mantis to you, which is a very interesting uh, bug we'll talk about. Uh, this was done in 2006. Uh, mixed media, it's kind of a collage piece. Uh, she uses all kinds of Western images from different um, advertising, fashion magazines, pornography, uh, National Geographic's, all to make up a non-Western image. So we see a female lounging back, as many of the nude females that we've seen in the past do. We see some trees. We also see this beautiful cloth that she is lounging on. So the cloth is referencing uh, Cuba cloth by the Cuba people. Uh, it's a group in Africa, and they're highly patterned uh, fabrics. So she's kind of giving us a sense of place with this. We also see her kind of gazing out at the audience. So she's interacting with her viewer as she is nude with her legs crossed, um, lounging back. So content of the piece. So the praying mantis is a sexual cannibal. Actually, when the female starts mating with the male, she also eats him. Um, so there's this sense of power with the praying mantis as <laughs> the praying mantis as her muse. She's kind of giving this female power. But then also, because we are looking at this history of the female nude, um, there's this powerlessness of the woman. So she's playing with this kind of juxtaposition of this very powerful uh, female bug, and then also the powerlessness of the female. Uh, but she is gazing out, so it kind of brings some of that power back. Um, the trees uh, are a part of a creation myth in Kenya, and she's actually a Kenyan artist uh, who lives in America. Uh, her work focuses on violence, sexism, racism. Um, in this piece, we're looking at the history of the female nude a little more. She also likes to uh, incorporate hybridity, cultural identity that's all kind of mixed together into her work, as we've seen uh, with other works. She's kind of pushing uh, us to think about putting things together that are Western and non-Western. If you think about uh, the use of the Western images to create an image that is non-Western, to kind of show this African woman on a kuba cloth uh, that is kind of Kenyan inspired. Uh, and then last, contextually, uh, 19th century, there was the colonization of Africa. Uh, and so that's kind of where she gets this start. Uh, since she is born in Kenya, she's got this uh, direct um, inspiration from her past and um, the experiences uh, on the African continent. All right, a little bit more about her. So this is a more uh, a newer work. I actually saw this one this fall. Um, this is outside of the Met in New York City. Uh, the Met facade was created around 1900 uh, by a, a, a now dead uh, white man. Uh, and the facade was always supposed to have sculpture inserted into these little niches. Uh, but it never happened. So it's about a decade later, uh, and a little more then, and finally they start to put sculpture in. She is the first person to be able to display sculpture within this space. And they're beautiful. There are a bunch of them. And um, she calls them the new ones, or the works are called the new ones will free us. Uh, and the point of her pieces is to kind of bring some of the beauty of African culture 
uh, African adornment, the women of Africa, and kind of put them on this uh, pedestal that is made by a white man um, at a time, 1902, where um, traditionally African Americans wouldn't be put on this pedestal uh, in such a way. So she's kind of challenging that uh, race, racial history. So she made history with that uh, really, really famous piece. Um, here's another one of her collages, just to show you she works in multiple different media. Uh, and here's a little bit of uh, what she says. To me, the female figure is enchanting and powerfully filled. It astounds me. It baffles me. When I was 19, I saw middle-aged women in Nairobi protesting their children's detention at a notorious torture prison. They slowly put a curse out by disrobing and exposing their bodies, causing the riot piece police to freak out and flee. I'm interested in how the female body is enhanced and contorted for historical and cultural purposes. So just to give you a little more background about her and what her purpose is. So from um, what you've seen today compared to works that we've studied in the past, you might notice that we have a lot of um, quotes and information from the artists directly, which is a really nice new thing. And if you notice each of these works, does in some way appropriate from the past, reference the past, um, just to kind of make you think, make you look back, but they're still adding their own modern twist onto it. Um, so just kind of a review for you here about the ones that we looked at today. Um, all of these artists, I believe, are on Art21, so there are more videos if you want a little more information. But I hope you enjoyed looking back a little bit. Our next video uh, for Wednesday, we'll be looking ahead.